Hello, my name is Daniel Tucker, and I'm the Graduate Program Director in Socially Engaged Art here at Moore College of Art and Design. And I wanna welcome you to um, our fall kickoff event um, in the Conversations at Moore series focused on museums and social engagement. We're really thrilled to have this program, which was originally planned as a in-person gathering um, last March and unfortunately had to be canceled and we're so appreciative of the participants for making the time to share their experience um, and expertise uh, in the context of this webinar. Um, I want to start out by saying that um, this program would not have been possible without the collaboration of both graduate studies at Moore and the um, IT department here who helped to initiate um, our Zoom webinar. That's Chuck Dunesk and, and Sean Flanley, who've been a, a great help in the effort, as well as our marketing and communications office headed by Nicole Steinberg. Um, but I also wanna say that this is a program that's in dialogue with our graduate um, degrees in socially engaged art, and we're training um, the next generation of curators and organizers and practitioners um, here at Moore um, who are trying to make transformative um, art and culture. And so I couldn't be more happy um, to have the introductions for today's event um, be facilitated by Ashley Gunter, uh, who's a wonderful artist um, originally from Washington, D.C., and who's a candidate in our MFA in Socially Engaged Studio Art Program here at Moore, um, who will be graduating next spring. Um, so Ashley's gonna read bios for the speakers, and then we'll hand it off to our facilitator and moderator for the day, um, Monique Scott, who's, who's coming to us from Bryn Mawr College's Museum Studies Program and is someone that um, helped entirely co-conceive of this event and we couldn't have done it without her. Um, and uh, so appreciative to all of you for attending. And um, without further ado, I'll hand it off to Ashley Gunter to do the introductions. Our speakers will um, have a dialogue with one another focused uh, around some questions prepared by, um, by Monique Scott. And then we'll have some time for Q and A um, in the end and I'll be collecting those questions if you want to add them in the Q&A function or the chat function of the program. Um, without further ado, uh, welcome Ashley Gunter. Thank you, Daniel. That was really nice. Um, so good afternoon, everyone. I wanted to thank you all for joining today's conversation at MORE. Um, our panelists today include James Claiborne, who is the pu Public Programming Manager for the African American Museum in Philadelphia, and an adjunct professor at Drexel University. Prior to working at AAMP, uh, James served as the Community Engagement Manager for the Greater Philadelphia Cultural Alliance and editor for Vi Visit Philadelphia's Philly 360 campaign. As a curator, James has founded the gallery program of Black Art Institute's Arts Institutions Art Sanctuary, presenting exhibitions by James Dupree, Am Amber Arts, Richard Watson, Deborah Willis, Barclay Hendricks, among others. Currently, he serves on the board of directors of the Philadelphia Cultural Fund, a nonprofit that distributes over two million in city funding to the region's arts organizations, as well as on the board of directors and advisory committee for Art Sanctuary, Art Blog, and other area culture institutions. We also have Brittany Webb joining us today, who is the curator of the John Ronan Collection. In this role, she stewards the collection of 300 works of art by 20th century African American sculptor John Ronan, and is charged with curating a retrospective exhibition of Ronan's work, publishing the accompanying catalog and distributing the bulk of the sculptures to museums across the country. Webb came to PAFA from the African American Museum in Philadelphia. She holds a PhD in anthropology from Temple University and a BA in political science from the University of Southern California. 
We also have Takufu Zuberi, who is the Lazari Family Professor of Race Relations and Professor of Sociology and Africana Studies at the University of Pennsylvania. Dr. Zuberi not only teaches and studies in the media, he actively is participating in the media. Uh, Zuberi is the curator of several exhibitions. In 2013, he curated both Tides of Freedom, African Presence on the Delaware at the Independence Seaport Museum, and his exhibition, Black Bodies and Propaganda. The Art of the War poster premiered at the University of Pennsylvania Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology. The Black Bodies in Propaganda exhibit was also presented at the Northwest African American Museum in Seattle, Washington in 2016 and at the Thomas Gilcrease Institute of American History and Art in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 2017. The last year, this last year, uh, Professor Zuberi has curated the redesign of the Penn Museum Africa Gallery. From 2003 to 2014, Dr. Zuberi was a host of the hit public broadcasting system series History Detectives. His documentary, African Independence, a feature-length documentary, highlights the movements to win independence in Africa. African independence was selected and featured at over a dozen film festivals. This feature length documentary on the history of ancient Sudan entitled Before Things Fell Apart is nearing completion filmed between 2012 and 2019. And finally, I wanna introduce our moderator of this program, Monique Scott. Um, she is the director of museum studies at Bryn Mawr College. She is an anthropologist that specializes in the representation of race in museums, particularly representations of Africa and blackness. At Bryn Mawr, Monique teaches about visual studies, Africana studies, and museum anthropology, and uses Bryn Mawr's rich collection of African objects for research and teaching, including organizing the 2017 exhibition, Exhibiting Africa, Ways of Seeing, Knowing, and Showing, with students of her History of Art class exhibiting Africa. Monique also served as the as part of the cult curatorial team led by Takufu Zuberi for the renovation of the Penn Museum African Galleries, which opened in November 2019. And she co-curated with Meg Only the 2019 temporary exhibition Color People's Time Quotidian Cast at the Penn Institute of Contemporary Art. Monique has also returned to the American Museum of Natural History several times to give lectures and tours on the history of race and race science at the museum, and was all involved in the 2019 exhibition addressing the statue about the controversial Teddy Roosevelt statue outside the museum. Uh, take it away, Monique. Hi, thank you so much for that, Ashley and Daniel. And I'm thrilled to be part of this and I'm thrilled to collaborate as, um, as we think about more collaborations between Bryn Mawr um, and the Moore College of Art. So this is a great inaugural uh, collaboration. Um, it's also just um, really an honor to be here with, um, with James and Takufu and Brittany um, visionaries and thought leaders and institutional provocateurs <laughs> and change agents working here in some of Philadelphia's most important institutions. And I'm also honored to, to call you my friends and colleagues. So I'm looking forward to the chat today. So my first question comes from the provocation that the Black curator is never just a curator. And this idea, um, which was the title of a Canadian art article um, about the inaugural Black Curators Forum, which took place in Toronto about a year ago, prompted me to think about um, the how the onus is often on us to push gently or radically. Um, traditionally, white institutions, white spaces, such as a museum, the capital M Museum, to engage with uh, race and racism and to encourage them to be more so socially and politically engaged, more inclusive, democratic and polyphonic spaces as the proposed new ICOM definition of museum suggests. Um, 
And of course, AMP has its own unique role in pushing the capital M <laughs> museum ecosystem. Um, so I think starting with James, can you point to something that you've done in, in your institutions that seem to push the envelope, push against white supremacy in new and unique ways, um, pre-apocalyptical 2020, um, or, 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 or now, so to speak. So James, James, Brittany, and then Takufu, please. Sure, um, well, I'm glad to be here, thank you. Uh, for the invitation, Monique, and all of the great folks at Moore. Um, it's awesome to be on a panel with, uh, with the, these two tremendous minds, these amazing folks, so glad to be here. Um, you know, I am thinking about um, this question, and um, I, think, I think by nature of the museum kind of being <laughs> that our, just our physical presence, um, our institution, our constitution as a nonprofit here in Philadelphia, um, a city with such rich black history and, th and thriving uh, black community um, is a bit of a, um, a stake of territory, a taking up of, of space um, that was not necessarily um, intended for black folk. Um, and so I'm thinking, and, and Brittany I know can speak to this um, about the, the museum's origins, the protest that went on amongst kind of white citizens in Philadelphia who did not want, um, I believe, our museum in Society Hill, you know, and so I'm thinking about the number of times people um, will send notes, you know, I'm thinking about the time that we uh, received a bomb notice and there's something about our presence and our being uh, that that affords us that space, the, the amount of times that, you know, we encounter someone in the digital front who is questioning why there is a black museum. Um, and then, you know, we'll kind of nonsensically pose the question of like, is there a, a white museum, an explicitly white museum? Um, and so I think uh, oftentimes within <laughs> Uh, kind of integrated into our fabric is this kind of sense of revolution. Um, you know, that article, you know, questions, you know, when is a black curator just a curator? And I, you know, I was pondering the same question came up uh, when I was on a panel of PAFA, I believe it was Norman Lewis, right? You know, we're thinking about like, you know, black abstraction and is, you know, black abstraction uh, by nature a political action. And so, so much of our work as black people just automatically gets folded into political uh, space and sometimes it's, it's by, you know, intentionally stepping away and going into a space that folks are not expecting to encounter a uh, black face, black work, black experience. Um, you know, pointed, you know, throughout our calendar year, we're frequently, um, in, you know, whether we're talking about play, uh, whether we're talking about jazz, uh, there's always, I think, a political kind of foundation uh, that is a part of our work. I think something that really, um, I think, changed me as a programmer and a curator was working very closely with John Dow and his exhibition around cotton, um, the way that, and I think, you know, cotton for me as a curator was very generative. And so John Dow is an artist who's living and working here in Philadelphia, who's interested uh, primarily right now photographer, but has history as a sculptor maker, as a sculptor rather. Um, and so um, I'm thinking about the way that, uh, and so through Cotton, he explores kind of the impacts of chattel slavery, the building of white wealth, and the ways that these are still rippling through our community through these gorgeous photos that he was rendering. Um, and so I think Cotton for me cracked, you know, really cracked open, you know, uh, and allowed, I think, space for everyone to come in. I think that's also kind of uh, the role we're doing at AMP. Uh, we're holding at AMP is uh, acknowledging the diversity within experiences of, of Black folk that don't always get acknowledged um, and doing so with authenticity and depth. Uh, a program that I actually started during Cotton, you know, as I would walk through the galleries, uh, sometimes folks would come up to you or sometimes you're just kind of eavesdropping and you can, I remember people walking by and telling stories about, you know, things that this work was conjuring for them. And so we created a program 
called um, AAMP Commune, uh, which brings in, in our gallery, brings in dialogue, brings in a performing artist. Um, I feel like the template for what I like to do programmatically is always loosely tied to what I felt growing up in a Baptist church, this sense of kind of spiritual fulfillment, this kind of building of community, um, and also kind of with a kind of intellectual kind of rigor. Um, and so we invite a performing artist to come in to do something adjacent thematically. Um, and in the case of Cotton, you know, there was a lot of room for blues. And I believe we worked with an artist who uh, sang some wonderful work songs. And, you know, with that as kind of a prompt, then we sit down with the audience and invite them in to say, what are you feeling? What are you thinking? What is this conjuring for you? And we just kind of bounce off each other while exploring the work collectively. And so that collective community building, that kind of holding of space, and also also, you know, you get the story from the Black woman who was raised in Canada who, who just feels like cotton is a beautiful plant, right, and comes in to, uh, to fully explore what it means for us as, some, as, you know, the descendants of formerly enslaved individuals. And then so we have a different connection. You have folks that talk about kind of, you know, working the land and remembering ancestors. You have the history buffs who kind of come straight ahead. And so I think our work is just about kind of creating space, creating that platform and allowing folks to feel some sort of like deep personal soul fulfillment. Yeah. And so yeah. uh, I think cotton is something that I always reference and I always try to conjure that feeling um, yeah. when approaching programming. That was an extraordinary exhibition and your programs were fantastic. <laughs> um, okay, uh, Brittany, thank you, James. Yeah, um, I sort of got lost in that conversation. <laughs> um, so when is a Black curator uh, just a curator? You know, when I uh, first saw, started to think about that question, I thought, oh, maybe, uh, maybe just in Black institutional spaces. Um, and then I was thinking about my time at um, AMP working and cura doing curatorial work and thinking, nope, that's not true either. Um, <laughs> I think, I think part of, um, part of what is sort of sneaky about that question is that curatorial work is so complicated. There's a lot of work that kind of like flies under that, uh, symbol, um, that doesn't like signal itself. So like, um, I think of that that Frank Sinatra song, That's Life, like I've been a puppet, a poet. You know, I feel like that's like that's curatorial work. You're doing research, you're writing, you're meeting with people, um, you're fundraising, you're building institutional partnerships. Um, I think part of the the nature of the work requires you already to do a lot of things. Um, but I also think that there's there's something about the history of museums as institutions. I mean, most uh, North American institutions, European institutions, institutions in the West have um, a history that's designed to keep um, folks of color in general and black folks in particular out of positions of power and decision-making um, roles. Um, but I think that in this moment, especially, um, you know, when you, when you show up in an institutional space as a Black person, um, there's already all kinds of um, expectations about the kind of work that you'll be able to do. Um, and I feel like in this moment, the, the way that we can engage in that work uh, really importantly is just to take the work seriously. Um, and so for me, I think about, um, you know, James, like Cotton was amazing. Um, I, what that brought up for me was thinking about, you know, that show went up when I was transitioning from working at AMP and being a grad student, finishing my PhD to working at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts and the conversations that I was having with um, other black scholars and curators in that moment um, to, to make sure to sort of take folks with me in all the spaces that we're in. And so I'm thinking about the work that doesn't show up in public. You know, we do all kinds of advising. We write recommendation letters. We teach 
Um, we serve on jurying committees for exhibitions and grants. I think all of that work is just as important as the work that's public facing because that's the space where uh, we can we can push things that don't necessarily seem public but have like very real material impact on people's lives once it does become public mm -hmm. great thank you thank you so much Brittany. to kufu you talk about pushing back against white supremacy in institutions quite often what are your thoughts <laughs> unmute please I want to express my appreciation for the opportunity to present my, my views and my ideas in this forum. Uh, Daniel and I go back when he was in graduate school uh, and, and Monique and I just constant collaborators one way or another. So I always know she's right there around the corner in my life in this world. <laughs> and that's a beautiful thing because brother needs some help and guidance and shoving and criticizing at somebody who would just tell him the way it is all the time. And so that's all good with me. I want to, you know, look, this is coincidental because I didn't think about this, but yesterday I taught George Schuyler, uh, Langston Hughes, and W.E.B. Du Bois, and how they were in a conversation with uh, Franz Fanon and uh, uh, what's the sister's name? Silva Winter. Now, let me tell you what all that meant to me. All that meant to me is that, and I'm, I'm reminded of kind of how Langston Hughes ended his thing. And he said, you know, um, we definitely want white audiences. He said, as a paraphrase, I read the quote in class, but we ain't in class, so I'm just gonna give you a paraphrase, all right? He said, uh, we want white people to, to check out our work. And when they do, we're happy. And when they don't like it and don't think we uh, should be doing this work, they're not important. And he said, also, we definitely want black people to appreciate our work. He didn't say black people, he said Negroes, you know, the whole timing kind of thing, but he meant black people. Uh, and then he said, but uh, when black people don't like what we produce, it's not important. <laughs> now, he was arguing against this view that somehow a black artist should declaim that they are a black artist. That is, they should argue against that. And so in his kind of handling of why they should not push back on that, he was trying to fundamentally deal with the question of what it is that they're doing in the first place and what is driving their kind of action and removing it from the kind of populist notion that we kind of have about creativity today because we're worried about how many likes a person got, how many hits they got, how many all this other stuff they got. So for me, when I enter these institutions, which are white supremacist institutions, because we live in a white supremacist world, and it's very difficult to disentangle from that white supremacy, and it invades all institutions and museums were created for this purpose. Museums were created as an instrument of white supremacy in the age of enlightenment. So places like the University of Pennsylvania, which I've had an intimate kind of relationship with for several years, uh, it, it, it is a place which has that history and that legacy. And for me in entering these places is how do I transform this space? If I'm in here, how do I change it? Because I think all of us have to always ask, what are we doing to change these narratives of white supremacy? What are we doing to help in these fights against racism, against anti-Black racism, these fights against the marginalization of other human beings? What are we doing? And so when I enter a space and I'm going to curate something, that's what you can expect. You can expect that it's a curation which is attempting to educate. It's re attempting to remove ignorance where ignorance can be removed. Because, you know, sometimes people are arrogant about their ignorance and they don't want to know. 
And that's the most harmful thing that somebody like who is an educator can ever see, is someone who does not want to eliminate their ignorance by having more knowledge. Museums are one of the central places where people go to get information to remove themselves from ignorance. You know, before COVID, they were boasting 850 million visits per year. That's more than anything in the society receives visits. I mean, you know, there's only 300 million people in the US. So to get to that number means there is a constant circulation. And we know how that works and it has its own rhythm and its own beat, but just that flow kind of gives you an ability to inter, inter, kind of just intervene and disrupt the national narrative that is full of these antidotes of white supremacy. The whole Black Museum movement has transformed museums. That's really what you're seeing. It don't, it don't just reflect in the creation of the uh, National Museum of History and Culture in, uh, in Washington. It, the precursors to that, you know, which is what we're talking about with the African American Museum here, what we're talking about with the, you know, the, the museum in Chicago, is what we're talking about with the museum in LA, that these things already created a kind of national consciousness that not to be nationally conscious about the experience and the history of the African descendants in this country does great damage to everybody's mind. And at any rate, the fragmentation of who we are is something that we must fight against. And so my experience as a curator hasn't been normal. Am I talking too much, Monique, <laughs> or am I good? Like, I, uh, you have a few minutes. Uh, no, no, you have one minute. <laughs> have one minute, all right. I know, so my, this my is like, Look, how can we minute. sum but, up all of this in a brief time? Right, my, 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 one, my one minute conclusion is I have curated not because I am just kind of the following the vocation of a curator. I have been a professor not because I have followed the, the vocation of being a professor. I have been on television not for doing that. In every one of these spaces, I have tried my best to disrupt the narrative which is presented and to offer other ways and venues of articulating our history and our experience to humanity. Mm -hmm. And most recently in the, the, the new exhibition, the phenomenal new exhibition at the Penn Museum. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So. You want me to talk about that? Okay, I lose up my time. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> you get another chance. So um, you, met, you mentioned the, or alluded to the pandemic. So here we are in 2020 in America. Um, and here we are at a moment when museums, museums have been having a crisis of identity for a long time, but a crisis of identity as, and these large institutions, um, as they prove their value in all senses of the word in uh, 2020, um, in terms of after the pandemic and, and, and closures and economic pressures. And, um, as they prove their value as spaces that respond to the unrest um, fueled by the killing of Black people in Trump's America. Um, so I am wondering, um, what, what changes have you seen in your institutions or the wider field of institutions as they attempt um, successfully, unsuccessfully to respond to Black Lives Matter, respond to the, the, the horrors um, of, I mean, there's been horrors for hundreds and hundreds of years, but responding to these recent horrors and the pressure to, to have a response. Um, Brittany? <laughs> yeah, I'll say um, there's something interesting to me as an anthropologist about this moment where 
uh, there are suddenly so many people um, in institutions with uh, an awareness of something that a lot of us have been talking about our entire lives, right? Um, and watching the response to that in our fields has been really intellectually fascinating. As a human Black person, it's been exhausting, uh, intellectually and emotionally, for a couple of reasons. Um, I think, you know, I'm, I've, I've sort of been uh, intrigued by seeing how uh, so many institutions that seemed like rush to their PR departments to put out statements that seem sort of flat and unthinking um, and maybe reflected the fact that uh, if there are folks of color in those institutions, if there are Black people working in those institutions, they're not in the PR department and those departments <laughs> aren't in communication. Um, and I'm thinking of museums, uh, schools, corporations, arts organizations, artist-run spaces, um, folks that imagine themselves to be well-meaning, but are also like talking over Black people, they know. Um, and so there's a lot of that. And so it's also been interesting to see the, the backlash to that in our field. Um, and if I could pick up on, you know, what the Black Museum movement did in, in this country is, um, we don't talk enough about pipeline and, and training and talent pools when we talk about those institutions starting up, started up by activists that still sort of exist for particular kinds of space, safe spaces. They also made it possible for there to be a pool of talented Black arts workers and cultural thinkers now. I mean, I don't think that there's been a moment in American history where there were more Black people who are talented museum thinkers, engaged intellectuals that are available to be participants in this conversation. And so much of that has to do with what are the institutions that are taking Black folks on as interns and graduate research fellows and as curatorial assistants and educational outreach um, folks, like people who are in the trenches doing the work. Um, and so that kind of groundswell of people both in white institutions and Black institutions and folks who have left those institutions um, have been a sea change that has been really um, partly enriching, partly um, sort of anxiety producing in this moment, I think, for a lot of people. That's been really interesting to me. Um, what I wonder about is because the because our institutions are so steeped in um, this this really um, deadly capitalist moment that we're in, really entrenched um, and really sort of subject to the way the wind blows. You know, when when there are particular kinds of when there are corporate interests in museums, there's a lot of funding for various kinds of projects. When there's a lot of government support, there's support for a lot of um, progressive projects. And then when that goes away, you see a kind of conservative swing. I'm thinking about what people talked about, like the culture wars of the 90s and how what it looked like in institutions when it really became difficult um, to get material financial support for progressive projects, which meant that institutions either didn't do them or they were asking the most progressive, most vulnerable folks in our communities to do that work uncompensated. And what does that look like in a world when we're in a pandemic, we're in a recession, folks need to pay rent, folks need to have health insurance? Um, like, what does it look like for us to, to be so hungry for this work and not want to compensate for it? Um, and so I'm seeing some, some fascinating conversations uh, happen around this that aren't always public. And I've been really, uh, sort of worried about the the loudest, flashiest conversations that are happening that are these kinds of flare ups where a, you know a, a major well endowed institution releases a black lives matter statement. everyone who is intimately um, familiar with that institution sort of pushes back and says, here's what it looks like inside your institution if you're an actual black person. What, why, are, why is this how you're extending your like, deep, deep resources um, when you could actually shift your deep resources in another direction and make material differences in lived people's lives? Like right now in 2020, when we're you know, leading up to one of the most consequential elections in our lives. Um, I think that 
I think we all need to do the work. There's a way that that is what it's reminding me. There's, there are material consequences to us not doing the work and only doing PR and marketing. Um, and I think we need to take seriously what it looks like if you are focused on the marketing and you're not thinking about how you're hiring, how you promote, how you're compensating people, how you're training the next generation of workers. Are you writing letters of recommendation for people? Are you sinking resources into the progressive shows that you think you want to see? Are you building audiences? Are you in what Adrienne Marie Brown calls right relationships to the communities that you think you want to be serving? Um, and if not, maybe is it possible that you need to sort of step out of the conversation either as a professional or as an institution and sort of sit back and do some deep thinking and research before you re-engage instead of just sort of spinning your wheels um, and running off a lot of smart people that I think we need to have in these institutions if we want to chart a different kind of future. Thank you, Brittany. Can we teach a class on this? <laughs> 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 so this, this moment, the way museums are responding, I mean, the messaging, what's happening internally, I mean, it's just, it's rich and, 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 and frustrating. <laughs> um, so thank you for that. Um, who would like to speak next? James? And then to Sure. Um, so I, there are three things that I'm thinking about and I'll try to be as efficient as possible because like usual, Brittany has my mind going in a lot of different places. Um, there's so many good nuggets there. I, I'm thinking about kind of, um, I'm thinking about like care, language and power. <laughs> um, I'll start with language. Um, you know, we live in an era now where we are receiving Black Lives Matter commercials, uh, messaging from Apple, from Target, from all, <laughs> all these places that sat quiet through the murders of Trayvon Martin and Michael Brown and uh, Philando Castile. Um, and so I am, I am de distrusting of language without um, action. And I think that this for me boils over or can I can glean something from that in looking at these solidarity statements published by everyone, um, published by organizations led by, you know, entirely white executives, entirely white board, kind of white led, white serving, I think within the realm of diversity, equity and, and inclusion, you know, a lot of folks uh, like to use the word mainstream, which I totally reject. Um, I think that we as an industry have become, and, and I think we're seeing this shift amongst the larger uh, kind of populist, we are we are becoming very practiced in la in the language of inclusion and in the language of diversity. These institutions can issue a, a a pretty solid appearing diversity and inclusion statement overnight, and it sounds good, but it's it's often not backed by the action. Um, and I think that care is something for me that drives my practice into action. Um, I care for Black people. I care for my audience. We're often not allowed to bring kind of our emotional selves to the forefront of our work, especially if you're working within, you know, uh, uh, environments that tend to want to mirror corporate infrastructure, um, that, that oftentimes your personal self should be left at the door for the sake of productivity. Um, it is, it is, I kind of put forward that, that care and that deep seeing and perhaps love of people can create a practice that also generates a sort of productivity. Um, and so for our institution, I'll tell you when, you know, COVID struck and we had to move very quickly into a digital front, I found myself at first very kind of resistant because I wanted to collect information. I want to understand the landscape, um, but, you know, was not really afforded that opportunity. So we just jumped in um, and started trying to bring physical to a digital front, some programs that we already had planned, but it became very, it became 
kind of clear very quickly that we kind of had to meet people where they were. Um, and so for us, it was about, you know, linking up with uh, journalists like Cassie Owens at the Philadelphia Inquirer, who wrote a great piece about how Black people were losing funeral traditions because we could only gather in such a small number, right? And what was that doing for funerals and for people who were passing with COVID? And what, you know, what does that look like? And so we brought in grief specialists and epidemiologists to have a dialogue. And what I saw, it, just by nature of the chat room, I saw communities in need, you know, and we were led through a kind of online uh, grieving memorial kind of exercise that was based on New Orleans second line where we thought of a person and kind of moved from place to place uh, where, you know, as they would do in a New Orleans second line. And for me, all of this is about seeing people. Um, and I also am thinking about um, kind of black liberation what I often see within our program is that when we're creating safe space for black folk um, and for black audiences that there is a trickle out effect um, and so you know when we have these zoom rooms and oftentimes in ours we're seeing our audience also on camera and we're seeing very diverse audiences attracted to these conversations um, and getting information sometimes getting emotional support from conversations that are about black liberation and black healing. And so I think a part of at least the way I see our work at AMP is like it's centered on this black core that deeply sees black folk, but there's something in the liberation of black folk and the education of black folk and these creating of safe environments that can be uh, productive uh, for a wide variety of folks. And so um, that's something I'm thinking about. Um, I'm also thinking about the ways many times um, uh, power as, as, as kind of manifested by, by money um, afforded many institutions an opportunity to, to not do that work, <laughs> uh, to kind of step over to issue solidarity statements, um, you know, reissue uh, pieces that they had already kind of developed, gallery tours, talks, you know, these folks that are sitting on years worth of deep archives then began manipulating that into programming. Um, and and I, that for me was uh, watching that on from my side uh, became, a, it almost became like an exercise of privilege at, in some ways. And so I, I'm thinking about the ways that all of this is moving through our community and has moved through our community. Um, and so I guess I'm carefully watching and I'm, I'm watching actions. Um, I'm watching the folks that are actually looking to kind of meet and address the needs of, of the audiences that are looking to our institutions. Thank you, James. Well, okay, we'll all te teach a class together. Uh, <laughs> to Kufu. Uh, thank you. I, um, I think of these, when I see these institutions in crisis in this way, I don't necessarily see crisis, I see an opportunity for change. I think I see an opportunity to expand space and an opportunity to move in different directions. Because I think until this point, the national narrative of the United States has been hijacked by white supremacy. And what I mean by that is that those who have articulated a Eurocentric, narrow view, uh, anti-Black view, have been able to give the message for what is American history, what is American society, what is global history, what is global society, and where all of this is. So I find myself intellectually aligned with those movements uh, for decolonization. That is those movements to remove the colonial basis of most institutional structures in the United States. Because very rarely do we pay respect or heed or recognition to the indigenous populations which had to sacrifice their very lives for the creation of this national narrative that they call the United States of America, that they call Canada, that they call Brazil, that they call Colombia. All of these places were built on the deaths and the bones of these indigenous folks. So decolonizing our consciousness is a way of recognizing the brutality of the founding fathers 
and a way to correct not only the fact that they have a patriarchal structure by its very naming, but that they also represent a group of white supremacists who have gave a narrative of America that distorts the experience of those who have been marginalized. And so decolonizing these institutions, and this is very uh, uh, salient now in the museum world because people are demanding that these museums decolonize their articulation. And this is tied up with deracializing these spaces as well. The racism and the white supremacy, which has kind of dominated the uh, the, the, the world, the kind of gallery world, the kind of uh, museum world has to be challenged in a fundamental way because it does nothing but support a national narrative which distorts the real history of uh, whether it's the United States or anywhere else uh, that this happens. So for me, the challenge is to how do you participate? How do we participate in decolonizing these spaces and in deracializing them? Some of it is changing personnel. Uh, obviously, that is necessary. But fundamentally, it's a change in a mindset. And just being Black doesn't give you a certain mindset. And what we really need is a transformation of what the job is. Because I'm sorry, if you put a black person in a position of a white person in a structurally racist context, they're not going to do but repeat that or fight against it. So it becomes essentially the question of what people do to transform these institutional spaces uh, in which we find ourselves. So we're at a crisis of identity, but that is an opportunity to change the narrative to present uh, something that would teach children that yes, you know, when someone is kneeling to protest white supremacy and the brutality of the police, it is not the same thing as a police kneeling on the neck of a black man to make it so that he can't breathe and doing it because he is anti-black. And that's whether the police officer is black or white or whatever themselves. The institutional structure has created and facilitated a space for them to act that out. Museums have been key to giving a racial tinge to American history, a racial tinge to the national narrative, a racial tinge to the international narrative of what it means to be a human being, to be a person, to be a citizen at this moment. So I want to be a disruptor in this way. Now that takes time because you got to work with people and you got to work with them from where they are and hopefully help them get to where you are so that then they can use their skills, their technical expertise to present to the public a narrative which improves our education and doesn't find the trajectory of power which is fighting for the devolution of the community's understanding. Thank you. Thank you, Takufu. Mm -hmm. So we have a couple questions that are, there's a thread of about care, uh, maybe because of your, your comments, team. Um, and one of them, um, is from my colleague at the American Museum of Natural History, Nick Martinez. He's asked, within museums, how do you balance speaking up about race and diver diversity issues um, and the mental emotional energy it takes to continually have those conversations? Um, and another question came um, in saying, my area of current research focuses on care or lack thereof for black femmes on the internet. Um, I'm interested in James' response, would love to hear from all the panelists. How do you incorpor incorporate care for black femmes in your institutions, uh, virtual programming, social media platforms? Um, James, do you wanna do you wanna start? And then maybe all of you as a way of kind of closing out is thinking about how you how you do this work. How do you emotionally, how do you care for yourselves? How do you find how do you find balance? Yeah, I mean, I think um, 
again, I think it's about seeing folks um, and bringing them to the table. Um, when it when I'm thinking about black films, um, black women, black queers, uh, I think that um, you know one of the one of the and Monique, you are a part of this. One is is uh, you invited me to PMA uh, for MLK to do a kind of a gallery talk. We did that talk, and then I was invited back to do a similar kind of in gallery talk uh, that was about a queer artist and. I felt like that was a time when I felt very seen, <laughs> that folks weren't just seeing me as uh, the black curator, the black programmer, you know, someone, but you recognize my queerness as being a part of that. And I felt deeply seen in that moment. And so for me, it's being willing to bring black films to the table to amplify their stories, their voices, their experience, their research, but perhaps not always when, um, when we're having kind of queer programming, uh, that we're looking at kind of the holistic person um, and that we're allowing uh, folks to bring their full self to the table, that if we're having p political conversations that we bring queer voices to the table when we're talking about um, kind of uh, things that kind of holistically affect the black experience because we are a part of that community, mm -hmm. right? And so I think that has been part of the practice of AMP. I think about, um, you know, most recently we did an exhibition uh, about black masculinity that was through the lens of 50 black women and non-binary photographers. And one of the things that I noticed in the work in an era where we're talking about toxic masculinity, we're talking about the ways that men, cis men, straight men can be problematic, especially upon uh, black films, upon black women, that there was so much care coming back from this lens and that they were looking at kind of black masculinity with such depth um, and kind of holding it. Um, and so I think that that's, that was an example of some work that for me um, kind of cracked open a conversation that was necessary and needed in our, uh, in our museum. I can tell a story, a quick story, anecdote. When we were in our gallery, we invited a, um, an artist in uh, who uh, identifies as male, but frequently will throw in a dress and some makeup, sings like Sam Cooke, but like is always kind of willing to play with kind of uh, clothing and push against kind of gender norms. And we were having conversations as two queer men, uh, but in, with the backdrop of this exhibition about kind of what rearing looks like for black men uh, as queer men. Uh, and I think we could put black films in uh, kind of a community with that and how so many times people are pushing back and trying to kind of shape us into what they would have us to be. At the end of this dialogue, a gentleman walked up to us uh, who sat very quietly during the conversation and thanked us because he had a Black film child who he was constantly trying to regulate in this way. And he, through our conversation, kind of had an awakening of the harm that could be done um, and and said, I want to call my child and apologize. And we said, well, you should, right? And so I think, you know, for, for me, that is an example of how museums can be spaces of transformation um, by putting folks on platforms um, and, in, uh, and in a space like AMP that is not explicitly a queer space, that folks are encountering narratives and voices and perspectives that they may not be expecting to encounter, that they may be, feel uncomfortable encountering. This, mm -hmm. We have similar things happen when we, um, uh, Rustin uh, Bayard, uh, excuse me, I'm messing his name up, um, part of the civil rights movement, and we screened his film, which also dealt with his queerness. And I can tell some folks who came in during our MLK program, were so uncomfortable with that, but the richness of his story and his role in history was so undeniable. I saw people act, you could actually see it in their physical body, how they were working their way and wrestling with kind of lived experiences in history. And those are the kind of things that I think, you know, we, we almost use this statement um, to the point that it would pull some of the power out of it. But I think that is really important within our museum manifesto. We talk about an, a comfortable place for uncomfortable conversation. And that's something that we'll hear a lot amongst our sector. But for me, I think that it comes alive and, and, um, and you can see that impact happen real time 
in the physical museum space um, and, and now on the digital front. And, and so that's a, a way that I'm thinking about Black films, Black queer folk, is just by bringing them to the table, by trusting them and by giving them platform. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I think I'm, it's, we're at time, but I think we can go about 10 minutes over. I'm actually, if it's okay with you, Brittany, to, um, to ask another question that's come up um, about unionization. Um, and one of the questions was about, oh, and I also want to say, this is a question about the PMA. I want to thank Damon Reeves for that, the program that you mentioned from PMA, the extraordinary Damon Reeves, curator of education there. Um, I know. Uh, so 250 plus workers at the PMA recently won a union election. They now need to negotiate their first contract. Is there language or policies you'd like to see PMA workers, maybe museum workers, when that would have better protected you, your peers, your students, um, others who others who work in museums? And have you seen successful efforts to nurture solidarity, specifically advancing Black culture workers in any of the spaces you're familiar with? Brittany? <laughs> That's a, let me tell you why that's a thorny question. I think that, um, you know, the last, uh, the last time that I was engaged in um, anything involving unionization, it was um, as part of a grad student union. And there's a way that um, their particular kinds of solidarity are possible when, um, groups of people understand themselves to be in political and intellectual and in philosophical community with one another. And that is the place from which they organize. Um, and I've seen instances where that has happened and it's been beautiful. I've also, you know, I know the history, the racist history of unions in Philadelphia. Um, so I know the way that, um, all that kind of organizing can be wielded as an anti-Black weapon, like quite effectively. Um, and that that has very real material impact on Black people quite effectively. Um, and so I, I wonder if that question isn't um, better posed for people of color who are at PMA, because that's not an institution, you know, it's a massive institution uh, that's been a huge part of Philadelphia's history since 1876. And so, I, I'm reticent to sort of speak for what I imagine Black folks at PMA who work at PMA who um, are invested in that institutional history um, are experiencing in that moment um, for all of the reasons that we've talked about, particularly those of us who've been in white institutions um, and know that the front-facing work um, that folks are doing to build solidarity um, looks one way to the public and a different way on the inside. Um, and I'm also thinking with um, some of the, the recent stories that I've been following in art press around like the various social media accounts that are that have popped up to call particular museums out or call out universities, call out art schools um, that are essentially these kind of spaces that essentially allow for a voyeuristic scrolling through microaggressions committed against Black people um, that you imagine uh, you know, this isn't self-reporting. This is, these are accounts run by white people for white people. We, the people who experience microaggressions on a regular basis, do not need to gawk in public at these microaggressions. Who is this for? Um, and so that's a way that, you know, I wonder, I, I, I just, I wonder what that conversation looks on on the inside, because I am learning in 2020 that it is truly impossible to fully understand the nuances of what's happening in an organization from the outside. Um, and I also want to flag that that is also my, this is a modality of my understanding of care. Like sometimes I think care is um, not speaking on something that you don't have expertise in just because somebody has asked you to. Sometimes care is passing the mic. Uh, sometimes care is deferring to, um, you know, an internal conversation that doesn't necessarily need to be public based on your relationship to vulnerable people who are involved in 
complicated struggles that have material impacts on their lives that they have not finished yet and mm -hmm. that you don't want to be disrupted. And so I also want to flag that as something that's possible for those of us who are affiliated with multiple institutions, because I don't think anybody, none of us only has a relationship with one institution. I think we're all working on projects for four or five or six different people uh, right now, particularly in this moment where folks are very interested in Black scholars but seem not to know enough of us. Um, so I think that that's something that is important to mark in 2020. Um, that's also about, you know, like the diversity advocacy and preserving your energy. This energy preservation piece is really important. Yep. Hear, hear, Brittany. <laughs> Um, so Takufu, last question, um, which is also uh, is, is, is still on this topic of care, but I am thinking about, you know, all the work that you've done at the, at the Penn Museum and, and um, to kind of, that has, the work on the Africa exhibit has trickled over into other changes at the Penn Museum. So I am thinking about how, I mean, you're, well, how you balance Pushing against white supremacy, um, your 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 curatorial work and other work at the institution, your race ra pushing like of the envelope on race issues, um, with a kind of the your own mental emotional energy, like to continually have these conversations. So me, personally, I get up at six o'clock every morning and I exercise. I try to eat a very strict diet just to keep me at a calm level. These are things I need personally, is to be balanced in terms of taking time to take care of my body and making sure what I put in my body is you know, appropriate for me balancing myself. So that's a big part of me trying to take care of me is me doing specifically something that is for me. Uh, the, the, the thing that I think is, is uh, so important in, in these spaces is that at the end of the day, I still have to come back to that me that I was trying to make healthy. And so the consciousness of that me needs to be in response to what I've done that day. So I do literally engage, when I teach a course, my co I have one course, it's called Exhibiting the Black Body. It's on how do you take a critical perspective, a critical race perspective before they make it illegal. How do you take that and apply that in, in the museum space? How do you take that and apply that in the documentary space? How do you take that and apply that in a television space? How do you do that in a university space? So for me, it's one, it's figuring out how to be an agent of change, an agent of disruption of the old Eurocentric white supremacist narrative. And I find that those who are ignorant of the need for this um, is not, those are not the problem, okay? Ignorance is not the problem. In other words, we'd have had the solution. The, the problem is the people who are arrogant about their ignorance and who argue against making progress and refuse to be educated because it's not equity. It's not like, you know, you get the statue of Robert E. Lee and I get a statue of, of uh, uh, Frederick Douglass is Robert E. Lee was a stone cold racist who wanted to support the continued enslavement of black people. And Frederick Douglass was doing the opposite. They are not the same thing. You don't put a statue of Hitler and someone who is a champion of the, uh, uh, you know, the, the anti-Holocaust or anti-racist Nazi policies together. No, you tear down the statues of Hitler. There's a reason for that. There's a psychological reason for that. And so museums tend to be a space of memorializing. It tends to be a space where you make memorial, uh, out, memorials out of the past, where you say what is important in the past. And this puts a very important burden on those who would curate because they have to act like those who want to teach because it is their responsibility to make sure that what they're teaching is correct and just everything is not correct. And it doesn't depend just on your point of view. It really depends on the point of view of something being correct. In other words, there's a lot of people we recognize now because they ain't even so deep in the closet 
who would terminate the existence of black people in the United States, no matter what that takes. So the fact that you have people like that doesn't mean we need to go and debate them about the value of black life, but they do need to be made clear that they cannot eliminate these people. So in that sense, I take the mission in museums and places like this as being very important. For those museums in Philadelphia, a big challenge for them and a big challenge for uh, for the newly unionized, if you will, because I agree, I don't know about their internal situation, but I do know how museums operate in Philadelphia externally. It would be good to just make the museums free and open to the community and to make sure that they are opening their arms and inviting the community in to do programming. That's what I think would be beautiful. Uh, if they want a, a very radical change that could transform, give it to the community. That's what these museums should be. They should be a form of public aid. In the spirit of Ben Franklin, how about that? In the spirit of Harriet Tubman, how about that? In the spirit of William Steele, how about in these people's spirit transform the space into something that's open for free education? All these museums should be that, whether it's the PMA, the Philadelphia Museum, the Barnes Museum, all of these museums should just be open their arms. And somebody can figure out how to endow that. I mean, I'm not that person who can figure that out. I would help, but we need to make access to these museums open and free. Your lips to God's ears. That's a great concluding uh, <laughs> comment. So. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I also just um, on the lines of care. It is so great to be in conversation with you and um, To have been in fellowship with you both inside museum spaces and outside of museum spaces. We've all shared a cocktail or two. And I think it's the way that we do continue to care for each other um, in having in having these type, types of conversations and and here we are sharing it, sharing it, sharing it with others. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Daniel. Thank you, more College of Art. Um, and thanks for the audience. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And peace. Yes. Everyone. Thank you. Thanks to Thanks to our moderator and our speakers, really, your, your generous work um, in offering uh, transformative ideas and proposals um, is something that I hope that we can all support you as you do it and lift up your work, but also take inspiration and, and do it um, in our own context. Um, and so thank you and um, hope that everyone has um, a wonderful day and that we can keep up this conversation about transforming institutional culture um, and ending white supremacy um, in the future. Let's keep having the conversation. Thanks for coming together. <laughs>